Live from KSAT 12, the 6 o'clock news starts right now. We begin tonight with a live look outside with live cam. Big changes coming over the next couple of days. Weather wise, it's going to get wetter. It's going to get an awful lot colder. Adam Kasky is tracking the latest of the cold and rain front headed our way. And I'll have details in your weather authority forecast coming up in just a few minutes. Well, among the first this week to get the Pfizer vaccine, long term care facilities, many of their vulnerable residents early on were among the first to die from COVID-19 complications. Working with pharmacies like CVS and Walgreens, more than 120,000 doses are being given to residents and staff at over 300 long term care facilities statewide during this first week of vaccinations. Jesse Degollado now with what this means to those who live and work at those facilities. There was much more to this moment than meets the eye. It was emotional um, just because I've we've lived in this for nine and a half months. Besides McCarty and about 10 of her staff, more than half of the residents here were given the first of two shots of the much anticipated Pfizer vaccine. We feel very um, privileged and blessed to be able to be in the, the first round of vaccines. Due to time constraints here on Monday, CVS Pharmacy will be back two more times to vaccinate almost everyone else except for three who declined. Tracy Holmes's 80-year-old mother, Carol, wasn't one of those. Having been at the assisted living facility four years, her getting the vaccine offered a sense of normalcy and hope. We would be able to be with her again and not have to visit through a window. And there's a lot to the gift of touch. Although coming from a family of health professionals, Holmes says she initially was unsure whether her mother should get the vaccine. And my brother said, why wouldn't we do it? I mean, why would we not do it? We have to trust science. We have to trust medicine. It's why she's urging other families to allow their vulnerable loved ones to be vaccinated. Why would we not want to protect them and protect ourselves so we can be a part of their lives again? Jesse Degollado, KSAT 12 News. The 2020 Valero Alamo Bowl is not letting the pandemic stop the major annual event from taking place. Game day is today, but officials have several safety guidelines in place to prevent the spread of COVID-19. Jaffney Gray is there live for us now. Jaffney, you've been out there talking to fans. What are they telling you? Yes, that's right. That, you know, the, everybody's piling in right now. The parking lot is filling up. And again, like I told you, everyone that I spoke with are just very happy that they're here for the big game. But they're even more happy about these safety guidelines in place. In fact, I spoke with one family who said that, you know, they're not sure how loud this arena will be with only 11,000 fans instead of the normal 65,000 fans. But they're still happy with the change. Now, another goal that officials were shooting for is contactless interactions among fans. When people arrive, they must have their temperatures checked. And if anyone has a temp over 99.6, have any signs of COVID-19, they and their party will not be allowed to enter. Face coverings are also mandatory and must be worn over your mouth and nose at all times, except when you are actively eating or drinking. And they have contactless ticket scanners where people will load their digital ticket to their phones prior to arriving. One family traveled from Floresville for the game and say that they are confident in the safety of this event. I was here a couple weeks ago for the boxing match and everything seemed to run smoothly. So as long as everybody follows the, the COVID restrictions, I think we should be good. Just hygiene, you know, wash your hands, cover your mouth. If you're sick, stay home. Other measures in place, mobile ordering of food will be implemented to avoid long lines for concessions. And of course, physical distancing is required. They are asking people to stay six feet away from other groups of people and to avoid using the elevators if you are physically able to use the stairs. Again, officials just hope everyone have a, a good time during this event, but they are also encouraging people to continue to wash their hands and to stay masked up. Live at the Alamo Dole, Jaffney Gray, KSAT 12 News. Thank you, Jaffney. Well, the search is on for a person to lead San Antonio's tourism industry in 2021 after the head of Visit San Antonio announced her resignation. Cassandra Matei announced her resignation effective next month. She is leaving Visit San Antonio to become the head of Visit Orlando, the top tourist destination in the country. But she says San Antonio is in a good place looking forward once the pandemic is over. Because we know 
through uh, tourism economics that leisure travel is going to come back first. And the fact that we are typically that choice of Texans, I think you'll start to see that type of travel come back first, followed by conventions. And then, of course, probably the last will be international travel. During Matei's tenure, the number of visitors coming to San Antonio has grown 37 percent and helped spearhead efforts to designate the city's colonial missions a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Her last day on the job is January 26th. Take a look at your screen. San Antonio police are trying to identify this man in connection with an indecency with a child case. The department says uh, the Special Victims Unit officers were called to John James Park the evening of December 23rd. No details on the incident were given, but investigators need help identifying this man just so they can talk to him. Anyone who knows who he is is asked to call SBU detectives at their number 210-207-2313. The case number is there on your screen. We also have all this information on our website at ksat.com. Let's take you outside now for a quick look at the roadways at this hour. You are looking at a shot of I-37 and Jones Avenue where you can see everything running smoothly and not a whole lot of traffic out there in that direction this evening. Well, if you don't know about the Pearl, it's a unique 22 acre area just north of downtown with green spaces, local restaurants, the Emma Hotel and small businesses. It is a popular destination here in the Alamo City. And as Max Massey shows us, there are more attractions on the way for 2021. It's easy to kind of forget how vibrant the growth of our city and our region is. San Antonio is projected to become moved from being the seventh largest city in the nation to the sixth largest city in the nation in 2021. In anticipation of more and more people moving to San Antonio, the Pearl is making big changes. We're going to be highlighting the five things you can expect in 2021. Not only are they bringing in new restaurants, but they're also making architectural changes, turning a parking lot into a green space. The park is set to open by next December, and you may ask, what about parking? Well, don't worry, there's a new complex called the Oxbow, which brings in 900 new parking spots. So that will be used mostly during the day and during the week by employees, but on the weekends and at night when things get really busy with people visiting Pearl, that will be parking that will be available. And one of the reasons for the new parking is the addition of new restaurants. Brasserie Monchouchou, which is right in front of Hotel Emma, and they've been open a couple of weeks, and it's just been so exciting to see everybody's response. Also, Best Quality Daughter opened on Mueller, and that's really been exciting as well. And that's not all. So we'll be opening four new restaurants next year. If you don't come here for the green spaces or the restaurants, one of the staples of the Pearl is the farmer's market. And soon there's going to be new merchandise to help out our local vendors. And for the first time this year, we've created um, in partnership with some of our farmer's market vendors, Pearl products. Um, so we've done, it's actually been really encouraging. People have loved these holiday gift boxes that we've done that have our Pearl um, cranberry, uh, chutney, our tomato chutney, and our uh, jalapeno jelly. This might seem like a lot, but Elizabeth tells me there is so much room to grow. She adds that the Pearl has a commitment to small businesses, and she wants to see them shine. Max Massey, KSA 12 News. The pandemic, cold, wet weather, and new restrictions notwithstanding, firework sales in Bear County are brisk as New Year's Eve approaches. That's what the folks at the Alamo Fireworks headquarters are telling us. They report customers say that shooting fireworks is the ideal way to celebrate the end to what has been a year like no other. With most public displays canceled this year, customers are planning their own private fireworks displays. No, the uh, county shows and city shows are canceled. They they still want to be able to celebrate and again, just get rid of 2020 and say hello to a fresh new start. All right. Bowdy says that though the pandemic has dictated masks, social distancing and other COVID related protocols, it has not slowed business at all. Customers tell her they are anxious to blow away 2020. A quick reminder, though, the sale and use of fireworks is banned within the city of San Antonio limits. Take you outside right now with a live look at live cam. Look at those clouds out there in the distance. Beautiful shot as we sit at 70 degrees, Adam. Yeah, it's nice this time of year we have sunset during the evening newscast yeah. so we can capture these beautiful pictures and have the time lapse of that as well. And we'll show that to you later on in the newscast, especially next half hour. Today we started the day at 64, made it to 76. A lot of low cloud cover with some drizzle and sprinkles, especially in the first half of the day. And we've cleared out a bit now. Temperature wise, it's warm, unseasonably warm. 72 Helotus, 69 Randolph and Rio Medina. 
68 in Comfort and 67 in Canyon Lake. You head farther southwest of town and they hit 80 degrees where they had more sunshine today. Catula still at 79, Laredo 80 and Del Rio now at 75. This evening pretty uneventful, just like yesterday at this time, a bit breezy increasing low clouds and that's going to lead to some drizzle later on tonight and to start the day tomorrow. Also some passing sprinkles, so dampness to start the day tomorrow and then rain chances increase throughout your Wednesday. So tomorrow morning the dampness, but by the midday and afternoon we'll start to see better chances of some scattered showers and thunderstorms with a high right near 70. Then cold front hits and temperatures really fall off tomorrow evening. I mean, we're talking mid 40s by 9 p.m. Windy and increasing rain chances with that colder air. So we're looking at a cold rain, particularly tomorrow night on into Thursday and a good drought denting rain. I mean, we could very well see one to two inches across the vast majority of South Texas, even in and around San Antonio and some higher accumulations as you head east and northeast of town. Now we are going to have some cooler air on the back side of this. And that should lead to some wet snowflakes for some locations. We'll talk more about that and who could see that snow coming right up. Well, as we have been reporting throughout the day, we saw some low case counts yesterday, that, but that was due to not being able to download some data from the state. So we are anticipating those numbers to go up today as we await just moments away the uh, mayor's briefing. Yeah, only 43 yesterday. We certainly expect that to be much higher. So let's listen in on what's happening. Update for the San Antonio community. As a reminder, yesterday we weren't able to report a full picture of cases due to an issue with the state's reporting. So tonight we are reporting 1,126 cases from yesterday and 975 cases for today. Our seven-day rolling average remains high and it's currently at 1,165. Sadly, we do have 11 new deaths to report tonight, five white females in their 70s, 80s, and 90s, two Hispanic females in their 80s and 90s, a black female in her 70s, a Hispanic male in his 60s, and two white males in their 60s and 80s. The stress on our hospital system continues to increase. As a reminder, the 50% occupancy limits outlined in, the, in Governor's, Governor Abbott's executive order, GA32, are now in effect. They will remain in effect uh, until the percentage of COVID hospitalizations in our region drops below 15%. We have 1,116 COVID-19 patients in all of our hospitals tonight, up 37 from yesterday. And we have 157 new admissions over the last 24 hours. 314 patients are in the ICU and 170 on ventilators. It's Tuesday, so let's take a look at our risk level for schools. While many schools are still on holiday break, we do remain in the red zone for schools. In-person learning is not recommended at this time, so if offered, it should be highly restricted and contingent on COVID-19 testing, at least 25% on campus staff once a week. Special education students, at-risk students, and students who lack access to resources required for learning should be prioritized for on-campus learning, and it's recommended that schools utilize fixed pods of up to six students or less. Let me turn it over now to Judge Wolf, and I'll come back with a brief update on vaccines. Well, as we've stated, uh, we're going through a, a very tough time, and it's expected to uh, last for at least probably a couple of more weeks. Uh, you know, we've all tried to struggle and try to understand why we're having such a difficult uh, time. Of course, it's across the United States. And uh, I mentioned in uh, at least a couple of our last two uh, broadcasts that uh, we're, Britain is going through a uh, tough time because there's a new strand and it's 50 percent more effective. Uh, we didn't know till just yesterday or today we found out. Uh, Colorado Governor Jarvis Paulus uh, stated that a young man in his 20s who had not been traveling anywhere uh, picked up this new strand. So it's here and probably in, maybe in our community too. So it's going to probably spread across the United States, maybe spreading already. And uh, it's not that it's more dangerous uh, in terms of deaths or illness but it spreads so much faster and 50% more. So you can understand uh, why we're all facing a problem and this is uh, probably contributing, contributing to it. Uh, 
we don't know yet the results of Christmas. That was the 25th. It usually takes at least five to 10 days to know whether we're going to have a bump up from that. And so that maybe sometime next week or part, middle, middle of the week, we should know, is it really getting worse because of the, uh, what may have happened on, on Christmas? Uh, so we probably won't know that till, till, early, till early next uh, week. Uh, we are getting in vaccines and uh, healthcare workers are getting um, inoculated and uh, there's a limit on what we have. And so we have to use that in a much careful way. And I would say one other thing about the vaccine, uh, we know some people have some effect on that. It's similar to what you may have after the flu, you may have a headache, et cetera. But there's a lot of misinformation banging out over the, uh, over the social media. And uh, I was listening to an NPR story today, and they were trying to refute one lie after another lie. Like you said, it alters our DNA. It's impossible for it to do that. So... Don't pay attention to that, please. I do pay attention to what your doctor is saying, what healthcare providers tell you, and then you make the decision whether you're going to get the uh, get the vaccine or not. But uh, please don't get uh, subscribed to these false stories that are banging across the social media. Yeah, very important. And thank you, Judge, for touching on that. And, and so for folks who are Tune in right now. Uh, our Metro Health team will be on tomorrow to go in depth on vaccines and take any questions at that time. But a brief update, we are continuing to follow the Texas Department of State Health Services vaccination plan. And to date, more than 31,000 people in Barrett County have been vaccinated. Uh, we'll provide, a, a, again, a more complete update tomorrow. But that is good news of the uh, roughly 51,000 uh, vaccines that have come to our communities uh, during the distribution process. Already over 31,000 of those have been uh, injected, administered to people who need it, front care, uh, excuse me, frontline healthcare workers. As always, you can get the latest on COVID-19 in our community by texting COSAGOV to 55000. You can also go to the website covid19.sanantonio.gov. There you will find all the health data on the pandemic, as well as information on our assistance programs. As you know, all right, as expected, the situation continues to grow worse by the day uh, after not getting uh, real numbers yesterday because we didn't have the full picture today. They're announcing 1,126 new cases for yesterday, plus 975 new cases today and 11 new deaths. Yeah, that brings our seven day rolling average to 1,165. As you heard them mention there, the hospital still under high stress. School risk level is high, even though kids are not in school. A lot of them anticipated to go back on Monday and that we're going through a tough time. Yeah. You know, we saw that new strain in Colorado. It's unknown if it is here yet, but uh, certainly Likely that's is. something to right. anticipate as we head into these next few weeks. In about five to 10 days after Christmas, we should know. Yeah. So about midweek next week, we should start to see the impact of the holidays here locally. So we'll hope that things get better, but uh, we'll be prepared for them to continue to trend as they are. Meantime, let's turn out to weather. 70 degrees out there right now, Adam, and uh, a lot of anticipation as well uh, in terms of the weather over the yes. next couple of days. Yeah, get ready for a cold rain that's headed our way and a good soaking rainfall, much needed rainfall that's going to be a drought denting rainfall. I have a lot of ways to describe it. Let's get to our future cast. We're going to jump right into it. Time it out for you. Basically, tomorrow morning is going to be just like what we had today. Low clouds. You notice 8 a.m. here, some sprinkles, areas of drizzle. So some dampness to start the day. Then we get into the afternoon. Rain chances increase a bit and we'll have some thunder here and there as well, especially long and east of I-35. The key is tomorrow night through the first part of Thursday, that's when we're expecting the most widespread showers to be moving through town and it's going to be a cold rain. Look at 1 a.m. Thursday, fairly widespread rainfall. And I like the way this computer model handles it because there will be some gaps in the showers. This isn't going to be just a continuous rain the whole time. It's going to be coming and going, but embedded within it, some good moderate to heavy downpours. We get into Thursday morning and that's when some colder air is going to work its way in. And I do think we've got a good chance of changing over to snow west and northwest of San Antonio. Not in Bear County. I don't think uh, we have a, we'll, we have really good odds at all of seeing any snowfall. But here are the most likely areas of where we could see the snow. I think along the Rio Grande, and basically from Eagle Pass through Del Rio, particularly Del Rio, and as you head northward 
Comstock, Langtree area into Valverde County and then into Edwards County. This is the most likely area where you see that purple and even the blue where we've got that moderate to high chance of wet snow on the backside and you get into northern Valverde, even parts of Edwards County, maybe a few inches on the ground, especially in grassy surfaces. We'll keep you updated but around San Antonio, a wet rain 70 tomorrow, 40s for a high on Thursday, then sunny and 60 by Friday. All right, thank you, Adam. Greg will be with, here with sports next. This essay salutes holiday greeting is brought to you by CPS Energy. Howdy, this is Andrew Higgins, Senior Director of Products and Services at CPS Energy. I'd like to wish all of the service members and first responders out there a happy holidays. It is game day. The Texas Longhorns will try and score their second straight bowl win in San Antonio tonight when they face the Colorado Buffaloes in the Valero Alamo Bowl. You may remember it was just last year the Longhorns upset 11th ranked Utah with a resounding 38-10 victory in which quarterback Sam Ellinger was named the offensive MVP. At that time, the Longhorns were hoping that the big upset would catapult them into 2020, only to finish a disappointing 6-3 during the COVID pandemic. Can this game be a springboard for UT into next season? Anytime you play in a bowl game, it's it's kind of serves two purposes. One, um, a, a culmination of a of a good season and an opportunity to to send your seniors out uh, with with a great memory, uh, and also like you said, to springboard our young guys into the off season of 2021 and and get a, a one last game under their belt. Colorado Buffaloes have three players from the San Antonio area on their roster. Freshman linebacker Devin Grant out of Antonian. Quarterback Mike Chandler out of Judson. Junior offensive tackle Chase Lytle out of Churchill, who is out for this game with a fractured leg. And get this, even though the attendance is limited to 11,000 fans tonight, this will be the first time the Buffaloes have played in front of any fans during this season due to the COVID pandemic. I think right now this stadium is seats about 35,000. I think they're going to have at least 15 to 18,000 people there which to me is going to look like a sellout compared to what we've been dealing with the last the last five games. So there's a lot of really good positive things about this. And, and uh, I'm just trying to get this team geared and ready to play well and, and hopefully play and get a victory at, at the end of this thing. Actually, the Alamo Dome seats 65,000, so a lot less. And look who made the trip down to San Antonio for the Valero Alamo Bowls, soon to be Hall of Famer Drew Pearson, who's in town to see his grandson Torin Pittman play tonight for the Colorado Buffaloes. So here's the matchup tonight. We'll bring an update on the game as soon as we have the night beat tonight. One of the keys to the fight in Texas Aggies' success this season has been their defense. Going into the Orange Bowl, the Maroon and White are ranked third nationally against the run and 12th in total defense. That says a lot in this age of pass-happy offenses. One of those anchoring the Aggie defensive line is... Uh, we talk to each other, we encourage each other, and we compete all the time during workouts, during practice, getting to the ball, strip, stripping the ball, making the turnovers uh, during practice. We just... We just come together. We've came a lot closer than the past years, and we decided, like, instead of just having the starters step up, why not we have everybody? And they have. Kickoff between the fifth-ranked Texas Aggies against 13th-rated North Carolina this Saturday in the Orange Bowl is set for 7 p.m. The Texas Bowl that's supposed to take place this Thursday between the TCU Horn Frogs and the Arkansas Razorbacks has been canceled. That's after TCU reported an uptick in COVID-19 cases. Combine that with contact tracing and injuries with the Horn Frogs below the Big 12 minimums for playing. This comes on the same day former Smithson Valley Ranger safety Trayvon Morig was added to the Sporting News second team All-America list. And I just saw this terrible picture of buses leaving Arkansas's campus empty today because the game canceled. Wow. Sure, we'll see more cancellations. And unfortunately, you're right. Yeah, thanks, Greg. We'll be right back. The fate of a potential boost to COVID-19 stimulus checks now falls to the Senate. The House passed the increase to individual payments from $600 to $2,000 last night. But as Nadia Romero reports, Senate Republicans may not support it, even though the president is pushing for an increase in those checks. President Trump continuing his vacation in Florida, golfing Tuesday morning and taking to Twitter to call on the Senate to increase stimulus checks, something the House agreed to on Monday. Two thirds being in the affirmative, the bill is passed. Now the bill is in the Senate. 
It's a risky position for Senate Republicans who don't want to disagree with the president and don't want the COVID bill to top a trillion dollars. But Democrats are all on board with the increase. $2,000 stimulus checks could mean the difference between American families having groceries for a few extra weeks or going hungry. The difference between paying the rent or being kicked out of your home that you've lived in for years. Senate Minority Leader Chuck Schumer tried to get the bill passed by unanimous consent, but... Is there objection to the modification? Object. The move was blocked by Mitch McConnell. The legislation could be voted on later if the Senate Majority Leader chooses. Now, all eyes on how Republicans will respond. Do Senate Republicans join with the rest of America in supporting $2,000 checks. How Senate Republicans vote on the measure well, Hello, DeKalb County! could have big implications on the pending Georgia Senate runoff elections one week away. God bless you guys for being out here. Both Republican senators, David Perdue and Kelly Loeffler, support the increase and have been touting the stimulus deal on the campaign trail. Well, I've said I've supported, I support it. Um, look, we have to provide relief to Americans. From Washington, I'm Nadia Romero. New at six, flu season is here, and this year there is even greater concern with the COVID-19 outbreak. A Stanford study in April 2020 suggests as many as one in five people who have tested positive for COVID-19 were also infected with another virus. Courtney Friedman with what medical experts say we can do to protect our family and ourselves. 25 days. Lenore Gutierrez is being more cautious than ever these days when it comes to her health, and with good reason. She was one of the hundreds of thousands of Americans who tested positive for COVID-19. My nine-year-old cried because he said he didn't want us to die. Lenore counts herself as one of the lucky ones since her illness did not require a hospital stay. But lingering symptoms have her concerned how her body will respond during the flu season. We don't exactly know how COVID will affect the flu season this year. If there isn't enough social distancing during the flu season, we could see lots of both types of viruses circulating. The biggest concern is that it could be hard to tell the difference between COVID-19 and the flu. The common symptoms of COVID are also seen in influenza. Dr. Nara Simmons said the loss of taste and smell are the only symptoms exclusive to COVID-19. That's why it's more important than ever to prepare early for flu season, get the flu vaccine, and test for both the COVID and flu if symptoms appear. It's best to get the flu shot early before the flu season and flu activity in the community peaks. And remember, the same social distancing measures that work for COVID-19 also apply for the flu. When I was sick with the coronavirus at home, I wore a mask, my children wore a mask, and my children did not get the coronavirus. Back to work and healthy, Lunor knows it's better to be safe than sorry. Courtney Friedman, KSAT 12 News. We are waiting for some big changes weather-wise. Adam? Big changes are right. It's going to be colder and rainy. We'll have a cold rain and some wet days ahead. That's for sure. So let's talk about this, starting with our rainfall potential. We're going to start with that because we're looking at a good drought denting rain for a good chunk of South Texas and even just the state as a whole. I mean, you look at the bigger picture, one to two inches, I think is a, a pretty good bet here in and around most of Bear County and San Antonio. And then you get farther to the northeast of us and those rainfall accumulations should just rise. I mean, you get between Dallas and Texarkana and you're talking four or five inches of rainfall. So the state needs it and it looks like this is the system to bring it to us. Here's our setup right now. This is stretching all the way up to the Canadian border out ahead of the main driving force. This dip in the upper level flow. That's going to drop southward into Mexico and set us up into a sweet spot to where it should really enhance some precipitation by tomorrow night. But here's our future cast again. Let's go through time tomorrow morning, 8 a.m. Low clouds, damp, a little drizzly, passing sprinkles. Same story through the noon hour, but into the afternoon, we'll probably have a few thunderstorms developing as well. So not everybody's going to be getting the thunderstorms, but where we happen to see some of the heavier downpours, there's likely to be some thunder associated with it, especially just east of I-35. Rain chances increase throughout the day tomorrow, and I think they peak tomorrow night. Notice 1 a.m. here, widespread rainfall. Peaking tomorrow night, 
on into the first half of Thursday. It's not going to be a continuous rain the whole time, but we'll see the rain coming and going. And here's the trick though on the back side of this as we get into Thursday, even as early as sunrise in Del Rio and Valverde County, you could see a transition into wet snowflakes. Even down into Eagle Pass, I wouldn't be surprised if you get some wet snowflakes by late morning on Thursday, 10, 11 a.m. You could even have some uh, some white rain falling from the sky. Then we get later into the day and we'll probably see more transitions over to some wet snow from the rain. And uh, that's mostly going to be to the north and west of San Antonio. So I'm thinking along the Rio Grande and in parts of the hill country, even down into Uvalde, I think you could see that changeover as well. But the greatest chance is Valverde County, Edwards County, parts of northern and western Kerr County and western Bandera County. And again, that would be throughout the day on Thursday. Now, the difficulty here is seeing where exactly the heaviest little spurt of precipitation is going to set up once we change over to snow because that could drop a few inches of snow just within an hour in these areas where we're most likely to see that snow. This isn't San Antonio. We're talking along the border and farther northwest of town, especially Valverde County, Edwards County. A few inches definitely possible Wednesday night on into Thursday. There's going to be a sweet spot somewhere in West Texas. Could be northern Valverde County, could be out in Fort Stockton where we could see several inches of snow. So something we're watching. 70 out there right now, still breezy. Winds gusted up to 23 miles per hour. Dew point is 60, so actually some humidity back in the air. Still near 80 in Catula, Carrizo Springs 75, Del Rio at 75. Here in San Antonio, we're at 70. And tomorrow morning, we'll start the day at 63. A little damp out there, increasing rain and even some thunderstorm chances into the afternoon. And then the cold front hits tomorrow around sunset. Behind that, we're talking cold rain tomorrow night, 9 p.m. down into the 40s with rain becoming more widespread and windy as well. Widespread rain tomorrow night into Thursday. Some change over far west and northwest of San Antonio. And look at that on Thursday with those showers. Only 44 degrees, the high temperature, and then we clear out back to sunshine, New Year's Day, sunny and 60 and a beautiful weekend. Good weekend to take down the Christmas decorations, <laughs> right? Bounce so bittersweet. Pretty nice there. Yep. Thank you, Adam. We'll have our Q&A with Mayor Ron Nirenberg right after this. Time now for our KSAT Q&A, and tonight we are joined by Mayor Ron Nuremberg. Mr. Mayor, thank you so much for joining us and for your time. I want to begin by asking you a little bit about vaccines. During the briefing, we heard the judge uh, mention that 31,000 people have been vaccinated here in Bear County. We know that the rollout nationwide has been slow. How's it going here? Is that 31,000 number on point? Where are we at? Well, it's, I think it's going very well. Um, as Dr. Fauci said uh, today, I believe, uh, the vaccination process typically uh, starts slow and ramps up. Uh, I will say there's some confusion at the state um, reporting because the state website shows that we've distributed roughly 11,000 vaccines. But in fact, uh, those that have been reported directly to us from uh, our hospitals, which are the main providers at this point, are 31,000. So we're doing very well. We've distributed uh, roughly um, 31,400 some odd vaccines of the 51,000 have been that have been delivered to Bear County. Just to piggyback off of that, I know that the federal government had wanted to have 20 million doses out by the end of December. Obviously, that's not happening. Only a couple million have been out so far. But President-elect Biden today said in his news conference he'd like to have 100 million doses out by the first 100 days of his presidency. From what you've seen so far, do you think that's even close to being possible? You know, that uh, it, it doesn't seem uh, plausible with the numbers that we're seeing across the country right now. But, but again, uh, the numbers that are being reported at the state level right now are several days behind what is actually uh, what has actually been distributed, administered here in San Antonio. So if that's the case, it doesn't account for the whole difference, but it is a significant portion. So uh, if, if, K, if the distribution and administration of the vaccine continues to accelerate as we expect it will, uh, and we continue to see these numbers and people coming in, uh, understanding that it's a safe and important vaccine to take, uh, I think we, we could make a significant dent in that number. Uh, it is gonna be through the first quarter though, uh, before we start to see uh, large portions of our population finally getting the vaccine. 
as we heard mentioned in the briefing, we are anticipating because of the Christmas holiday, our numbers to increase, unfortunately. Um, what, are, what are the models suggesting? What, how are we gauging where we're headed right now? So the models that we've seen, again, we got an update uh, about a week or so ago, have shown that you know we are tracking uh, with the summer numbers, but they're moving up at a slower pace. And that's important because, you know, again, it's about making sure that we can treat the ill, uh, most importantly, in our medical system capacity. And uh, slowing down the acceleration of the cases and the hospitalizations is very important. Uh, in, in that, in that, for that reason, uh, so we will see uh, more hospitalizations. We will see more cases. There's just no doubt about that because of the amount of interaction and, and transmission that's going on. Uh, but, but again, our our work to ensure that we're testing in extremely high volumes. Again, we're, we're testing probably four times the number of people we tested during the summer. Uh, our work to ensure that we're contact tracing and investigation investigating quickly. All of the cases is all work to slow down the spread of the virus. Um, but, I, but I'll emphasize what we know will slow down this virus is what we knew from the very beginning. And it's that much more important when we have community spread and we think a lot of the transmission is happening in people's homes. It's that much more important that we when we go out of our houses, when we go out into the world, that we wear a mask and that we maintain physical distance. That Those are our primary methods for slowing down uh, the spread of this virus. All right, Mayor, we are up against a break. Uh, we'll continue the conversation with you right after this. Great. Welcome back. We are continuing our Q&A session today with San Antonio Mayor Ron Nirenberg. And Mayor, we saw a lot of criticism following the boxing event that was held recently at the Alamo Dome tonight. The Alamo Bowl is happening, about 11,000 uh, fans there. Can you defend the decision to have these large events as we continue to see the numbers increase? Again, um, the, the events that have been held at the Alamo Dome have been at a much reduced capacity, uh, and the uh, plan to execute those events approved by the health department. So we want to make sure that in any event that's happening in any place in the city that's permitted under our orders or the governor's orders that they're held in a safe manner. And so the occupancy uh, is being limited to 17%. Uh, according to the seating plan, people will be spaced apart. There will be touchless concessions. So all the measures that are being put in place are to minimize the risk of any transmission. And so far during the events that have happened at the Alamo Dome, there has not been any incidents. Uh, that being said, we are going to enforce very strictly those health codes. And so if anyone is, is going, planning to go to an event that's held in the city facility, they need to be ready to uh, adhere to the health codes, otherwise watch from home. Uh, and we're gonna hold accountable to that. So uh, that's gonna be the method. Um, we've got to make sure that we're adhering to the health guidance no matter where, uh, where you are. And certainly that goes uh, doubly in a city facility. Mayor Ron Nuremberg, thank you so much for your time and happy new year. Happy new year, Mayor. Happy new year, guys. We'll be right back. Here's today's in case you missed it. Good morning, 601 this Tuesday, December 29th. Thank you so much for starting your day with us. Starting today, bars in Bear County must close their doors and businesses, which are currently operating at 75% maximum capacity, they have to actually scale back to just 50%. Begin this evening with new information about the COVID-19 variant found in the UK. The first reported case of that variant has now been found here in the US. Scientists believe this new strain is more contagious than previously identified strains of the coronavirus. The county Sheriff's Office arrested a man who was in possession of a fake DEA badge, gun and handcuffs. Now they want to know what he was doing with them. This is Mark Anthony Hernandez. The Sheriff's Office says deputies found the items in his car after he crashed. He was arrested on suspicion of driving while intoxicated, and deputies initially thought they had arrested a DEA agent. They soon learned that wasn't the case and that the badge was fake. And it's not just Bear County seeing a surge in cases and hospitalizations. A record number of people are now in the hospital for COVID-19 across the U.S. And though people continue to get vaccinated, health experts worry it's not happening fast enough. Just over 2 million doses have been delivered so far, which is well under the goal of 20 million by the end of the year. The biggest problem is getting the vaccines from the states into people's arms. There's a lot of steps and there just hasn't been much planning. There hasn't been much investment. 
Meanwhile, another vaccine may be on the way. Drug maker Novavax is in phase three trials for its vaccine. <laughs> Coming up right after this newscast, we are airing a one hour Defenders investigative special tonight with a collection of stories with a focus on protecting you, your loved ones and our community. You'll also see stories on COVID help, problems with the justice system and scam allegations. The Defenders protecting you tonight at seven right here on KSAT. A little damp to start the day tomorrow, then we get into Wednesday afternoon and rain chances are on the rise, even some thunderstorms. By Wednesday night and on into Thursday, that's when our rain chances peak and we're expecting the most widespread rainfall. On the back side of it into Thursday, yeah, we could have some areas of snow, some wet snowflakes, especially far west and northwest of San Antonio. You see around Bear County, odds are very slim of seeing any rainfall. You really have to get out to the Rio Grande and even Valverde County. Edwards County, parts of the hill country in and around there for the better chance. And there could be some accumulations out there as well. So something we'll be watching. But around here, I think it's just going to be a cold rain. 70 tomorrow, but then only in the 40s for a high with that rain on Thursday. And then into Friday, back to sunshine. All right. Thank you, Adam. See you back here for the night beat tonight at 10. Have a good evening.